Hi everyone, 
My name is Yanis fucking Yansha, and I'm happy to welcome you to the fourth episode of Reprogramming Strategies for Self-Renewal, the festival of conversations curated and conducted by Spanish writer and journalist specialized in technology and power, Marta Peirano. Reprogramming consists of eight streaming events taking place on a monthly basis throughout the year. The first three episodes, respectively with Keen Stanley Robinson, Benjamin Breton, and Holly Jim Buck, as well as further information about the series, upcoming guests, in-depth material, partners, supporters, and so on, are available on the project's website. Today's guest is the designer, artist, and filmmaker Anab Jain, co-founder and director of Superflux, a speculative design studio based in London that explores the intersections of climate crisis, technology, and more than human politics. Along with her partners John Arden, she has produced critically acclaimed films, art and installations projecting the many possible futures for humankind. Anab has worked for some of the world's biggest like Microsoft Research, Sony, Samsung and Nokia and institutions like the United Nations Development Programme, Future Cities Catapult and the Forum for the Future. She has exhibited work at MoMA New York, the National Museum of China, the Tate Modern and the world's leading museum of art and design, Victoria and Albert in London. As usual, even today, we have some special guests in the studio who in the second half of the event will enrich the conversation with their questions. Furthermore, we invite everyone out there to participate in the debate through the web chat available on the website which allows you to share thoughts, considerations, doubts, links with the rest of the community and ask questions to our guests. Here we go. Anab Jain talking to Marta Pirano. Anab, Marta, thanks for accepting to be part of this. Take it away. Well, hi, and thank you, Janice, for your always super kind introduction. And uh, hello to everybody watching us uh, right now. So the future, as we all know, is already here, but it's just not evenly distributed. This is the most famous uh, quote I know about the future. And this is uh, something I thought a lot about while I was, um, uh, when I met an Jain and uh, her superflux uh, and, and life partner, John, in Barcelona, I think a year and a half ago, it feels like a century, when they had built an apartment for their son at the uh, Center for Contemporary Art in Barcelona, but placing it 30 years in the future. And I remember thinking that the apartment was nothing like the future, at least from uh, what, I was, what I was coming from, because, you know, it wasn't white, it wasn't super clean, it wasn't like hypoallergenic, there wasn't classical music in the background, it looked nothing like the future, it was more like a super familiar and cozy and interesting and fun kind of mixture between a kitchen and a workshop and almost uh, my teenage bedroom, I guess. And so since then, I've been really wanting to ask Anab how they did it, like how if the future is a science or maybe it's more like storytelling um, and what would be the tools of that science and how, you know, how can you make the future feel so relatable in a world that is changing all the time and so fast. So. Um, so today we have Anab Jain and uh, welcome to Reprogramming thank and thank you for being here, Anab. Thank you. Thanks, Marta. Thanks, Yanis, for inviting me. It's a pleasure. I mean, we know um, you're super busy because you're preparing uh, your next installation for the uh, Venice Biennale. So it is a double, double lottery that we have you here. So let's get to let's get to it. Um, is it first of all like is the future a science or is more like storytelling or what is it exactly? Thanks, Marta. Um, it's a good question. Um, 
I suppose many people would say uh, that future learning about the future or understanding the complexities is a science. It's practiced as a science by many um, or a sort of kind of science, I think. Um, for us, um, we kind of maybe sit alongside the kind of uh, more traditional community of futurists and foresight practitioners um, and bringing the creative and the imaginative uh, side of things to to thinking about the futures because for us uh, and, and and increasingly for for most people who practice futures it's become evident that the future beams no data back to us it is intrinsically uncertain and um, the best way to deal with such uncertainty is with creativity and imagination um, it is to kind of equip ourselves with many possible options, many possibilities, and to explore those possibilities and trace those threads of possibilities back into the present to understand what sort of decisions we are taking today, what kind of actions are we getting to make today that would affect each of these possibilities. Um, so it is never a self kind of fulfilling idea that we, we get to know the future really well. There are many different futures, many different possible futures from different perspectives, from different people, from different territories, from different contexts. So for us, it's all about, you know, wide ranging processes of analyzing data, watching trends, scanning emerging technologies, but also looking for ethnographic and anthropological insight. Um, and, you know, really following intuitive hunches, exposing ourselves to new ideas, getting a sense of their emotional content, reflecting on our own emotional responses. Um, you know, all of this, what you might call weak signals. Um, and then it's about weaving often what happens at that point in this kind of what process that you might call critical sense making, there is often a desire to then start slicing it into quadrants or into categories or into territories. And at this point, what we try and tend to do is try and find connections, interconnections, and try to weave these together to create much more kind of complex worlds, possibilities, whatever you might call it. So in some ways, we have this very expansive canvas. And quite often, we, we zoom into a spot where a lot of these um, interdependencies correlate. And then we try and build that world for real. And that's how mitigation of shock, the apartment you were talking about, came into being. Super installation. Um, it had a great impact on me. And I really like this thing you just said, that the future doesn't be data back to us and and even in the image you can you can see this idea that everything that we see as the future is just a reflection of the present and ourselves no and um mm. and we can choose <laughs> we can choose to change um ourselves in order to to have a different reflection from the future i guess uh but since you've been doing this for qu quite a long time now i would imagine that in the last I don't know, 10 to 15 years, you have become very good at choosing the right signals. So I am curious about what kind of weak signals do you, do you find more prevalent or interesting in your own work where you uh, promote creativity more than maybe other factors? Um, that's a really good question. Uh, thank you. Um... It's really hard to say which is a better weak signal as opposed to others. It's um, I think um, I, I think we are we, we are interested in arriving at new and surprising places. We 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 we, we really uh, think about po the possibility space. You know, uh, what does it mean um, in, in Donna Haraway's uh, language to stay with the trouble? What does that mean? It means that we are op open to the, to, to the weird and the provisional. We are open to the, uh, to the unknown and the uncertain. And, and, you know, I think that's where the interesting things start to happen. So we, we may have something that is really strange but it's never seen in isolation. So if you take the apartment, for instance, it is the idea that there's a book called Pets as Protein. 
which is deeply provocative and, and, and difficult to digest it, it just but it is it is based on a certain amount of weak signals but it sits within the context of a familiar space which is the home so i think it's about understanding that these these um these ideas these kind of things that are happening on the fringe of the possibility space at what point and in what way do they manifest into our everyday life and into our lived experiences and 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 what we find really exciting is the is the is the idea of making it in some ways tangible in some ways experiential so that it's not an abstract idea on a on a, on a piece of paper or or on a slide but it's really something uh, that can be experienced and i think that that that's at the heart of a lot of our work well i must say like coming back to that that one of the pieces that i was also most impressed with was this um spray that you built for um i think the abu dhabi or the dubai government i i don't recall yeah. right now mm -hmm. where you literally compressed the air that they were gonna have in 35 years, years time if everything was to go on <laughs> as it was and and this idea that that you can give enormous amount of data about how many people will die because of breathing conditions and how uh, dirty and I don't know disgusting being living in the city will be but it's so much better to have the spray and spray it right into the nose of someone <laughs> to give him or her this this you know this I guess this reality bite uh, in this case, and the, the whole idea of, of pets as protein or the this recipe for what like fox creole that we, you had in the apartment. Uh, for me, I have been a vegetarian for I don't know for decades. It was definitely disturbing and uh, and thought pro provoking, and it made total sense, no? In a time where so many people are like just like learning to learn, learning to use the art, for instance, no? The idea mm -hmm. that that fox mm -hmm. somehow save you <laughs> from hunger in the in the future. But one of the things that I find also interesting is how, and we can see this with the pandemic, how normally all our uh, visions of the future tend to be so related to the past that we always prepare for the pandemic or for the disaster that we just had. <laughs> like, you know, every, um, uh, preparation for pandemics will be related to coronavirus, um, you know, from, from now on, just because mm -hmm. it's the most recent one. And I wonder, because for me, this, this is like a kind of trauma response, no, where you are responding to the present, but, um, but thinking of something that happened to you in the past and as if it was something that happened to you in the past. And I wonder if you have any conceptual or even technical mechanisms to avoid that. Mm. Uh, wow, um, that's a really interesting way of framing 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 the trappings that we might uh, find ourselves in. It's um, um, I think there are two things here. I think on one hand uh, there are no futures without our histories. So I would say I think a lot about the history and think about histories. I think a lot about plural histories and plural narratives and pl plural points of view that have shaped our present and therefore will shape our futures. Um, so I think at one level, if we are able to learn from our histories, if we are able to look back and reflect and consider our place in our history currently, that would definitely play a role in how we consider our futures. Uh, on the other hand, to avoid just determining a response to a pandemic based on a current situation is is to do this kind of multiple uh, multiple levels of critical sense making. So you know uh, you you are collecting and you are uh, and encouraging everybody else to to be be self aware, uh, aware of our predispositions, aware of our biases as much as you can be because you you know, to separate oneself from the self 
and oneself's bias is, is not very easy, even sometimes impossible. But how, But that's when you bringing plural perspectives helps. Um, and then, of course, you know, there is, um, if you think about the army or you think about uh, war prep uh, scenarios, there is a lot of this kind of simulation and uh, scenarios being done for things that have not happened yet. Um, mm -hmm. And I think um, much as I hate that uh, idea of having to, um, the idea of, of, of having to consider ourselves to be preparing for war in, in itself, um, there's a lot to learn from, from the idea that we, the, every future that we Im that we can imagine something different is going to happen than what we've imagined. I think if we can acknowledge that, then we are in a place where we've suddenly become a lot more open to possibilities. Hmm. Yeah. Also, this idea that the future is here is just happening at different times in different places. Also, 100%. is contained in that idea that every imaginable free future is actually mm -hmm. possible. No. But another yeah. thing that also interests me of your of your research is that going like going to, to history, history has has this habit of thinking that the things that change the future are events or people, no, like uh, like someone like assassinating the Austro-Hungarian Empire here or um, or the art school rejecting a non so not so promising artist, <laughs> or um, as you have pointed out um, in a really interesting talk in Matadero in Madrid, um, the refusal of a soldier in India to turn against his own people. Like we like to to learn about the past in this in these terms because it makes it easier. It's easier to learn <laughs> and to remember, like you know, there are good and bads, and and everything is simple. But I would imagine that when you are doing the systematic scan that you do for your work, you probably yeah. discover other things, no, other mm -hmm. patterns. And I wonder. So, what are the things that change the future? <laughs> wow. Um... Oh gosh. Do you have a um, profile? <laughs> um, I wish I knew. I mean, um, <laughs> do you know, it's uh, it's 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 really, you know, it's in 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 a way it's not about that I don't think anybody can, I don't think you can just say I want to change the future and we change the I just uh, I think um how should I say this? It's, um, you know, a lot of the work that even science fiction writers, I believe, do, uh, even though they're talking about completely speculative or kind of fantasy uh, worlds, is a reference to the present, is a reference often to our condition now. And, and what, you know, it's, 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 and that's what even, you know, in some ways we've been doing with mitigation of shock, for instance. It is about thinking about all these different, um, tools that we have access to uh, uh, in terms of growing our own food, in terms of having cooperative relationships amongst each other, built on trust, built on uh, sharing resources. You know, there's so many multiple layers of it. And so I think that's what is one way of doing it, is to not shy away from complexity. I, we, we do live in a world where advertising and and it's a kind of simplistic narrative has seduced our our kind of attention span to remain completely like give me that one liner or give me that you know the one hero and you know the archetypal hero story promoted by hollywood these uh, you know are a documentary with the god's voice kind of narrator uh, telling us what to think and how to think and what to watch these narrative forms uh, need to be challenged. And I think uh, they need to be challenged in a way that are still accessible, that uh, don't put people off because you do, we, we are looking to talk to wide audiences and wide and diverse groups of people. But um, I think um, just uh, keeping at it with multiple 
types of genres and narratives and counter narratives is, is I think the way forward to avoid um, this hero worship um, idea of, you know, putting, putting all your eggs in this, this hero did it. And, you know, in that talk, I do talk about the fact that even though it was, yes, it was Mangal Pandey who did um, start, start the kind of revolt. Um, it was so many other soldiers at so many other places across India who were ready and prepared to do the same. And mm -hmm. it was 90 years later that India and Pakistan had what you might call independence. So this is a long and a slow uh, revolution um, with countless people's um, sacrifices um, in it, always, I think. Indeed. And before I ask the next question, I'm going to remind our listeners that you can leave your own questions for an app in the, in the comments uh, box section that Axioma has pre prepared for you. And going back to that amazing talk that can be found online, it was in the context of um, Tentacular Festival in Matadero, Madrid. Like uh, you started precisely with the supposedly, as you just explained, um, rebellion of one man that triggered the revolution. But what you wanted to talk about, <laughs> that was your introduction to what you call the fungal revolts, which already in its concept is such an amazing idea and such a promising scenario, no? And, uh, mm -hmm. and I would like you to explain, as you did then, what are these fungal revolts? Because they are the opposite of the one hero journey, mm -hmm. no? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, you know, I mean, I take no credit for it at all. I am so deeply inspired by the works of so many scholars and ecologists and um, um, scientists and gardeners and philosophers who, um, uh, who over the last decades and maybe centuries have talked about um, the, the kind of ecological cooperation that we see because of which so many of our uh, planetary species are thrive are th able to thrive um and um the fact that you know the ground we stand stand on underneath it is is this beautiful rich network of fungi who are uh, passing nutrients to different species to trees um in this kind of uh kind of beautiful uh, mutual aid network if you like so that is such a beautiful idea that we don't have to it's not we don't have to like it's not a it's not fiction you know it's right under our feet it's it's here it's with us and i i really find that beautiful because could, could we imagine that that kind of uh um coming together of, of a cooperative network that uh, that that kind of connects these different ideas and our different idea of aspirations and hopes for the future into something bigger uh, that um, e, 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 so all these kind of micro revolutions of all these different fungal uh, networks creates a bigger a revolution and and that's what i meant by a fungal revolt it was really drawing inspiration from these beautiful uh inspiring um our, our companions that uh that uh feed um uh, each other under under our very feet indeed and i mean you can tell <laughs> that your following works have been definitely soaking on that idea because um especially now that the pandemic has revealed how this incongruence of mass production uh that is not only extracting from everywhere to be to be transformed into something that becomes trash somewhere else but also is always coming from the same places uh and also that our distribution networks also mm -hmm. the in, in, in comprehensible <laughs> fragility of this of this um of this patterns of, of distribution and so the big questions about design 
have moved from what to the sign a bit back towards the why the sign and where to do it and why to produce the subjects. And then mm -hmm. most of the objects in, in this uh, mitigation of shock installation, the room we were talking about, are actually useless electronics. They are electronics that have been rendered useless, uh, that were like what, what we could say, the internet of things uh, pieces, no? <laughs> Our artworks yeah. that have been repurposed or you could say DIY'd into food computers, computers where you mm -hmm. grow fungus and, and locusts and, and uh, all sorts of plants. So I would, I mean, I, I like to think that this, that this changes uh, mirror bigger ones and the way I think they are embodied in this uh, work is in this narrator's comment, no? your, your son in the future in this case, uh, commenting how he used to ignore his neighbors um, because they had terrible taste in music and how now they have, and I'm gonna quote, they greet each other with a deep sense of solidarity and mutual dependence. So um, I see how this moves and, 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 and widens in scope in the next mm -hmm. iteration of mitigation of shock, which is more like a, an apartment in Singapore where the landscape becomes a very big part of this. So can you, can you explain what was the transition from the small apartment in London to the wide angle view of a, a, a Singapore that has been drowned and has somehow become, you know, a prosperous, beautiful city out of that drowning? Yeah. Um, it's really interesting because, you know, for us, actually, when the London apartment was, we saw it as hope, as a hopeful uh, apartment, even though it was labeled as dystopian. Um, and mm -hmm. it's really interesting that the Singapore one, as you describe, is full of hope because, you know, just before the uh, really tragic wildfires in Australia, a lot of visitors who would go to Singapore um, Art Science Museum would, um, would talk about the fact that they cannot imagine such a living in such an apartment that it felt so dystopian. And just after the wildfires, visitors f f were uh, uh, going there and saying, this is too utopian, it could ne the world is not going to be so nice. Um, and so I think uh, one to, to, to one point that, uh, that, that we have such a short term memory of what we imagine the future to be and that memory is formed based on very immediate kind of experiences that we do, which is which is one of the reasons why we create these kind of embodied simulations is because in some ways that is one way of pre-experiencing a future in a way that sits in your memory as, as a possibility. So, um, uh, that, so, 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 so one is that uh, with the London one, with the idea that, you know, your um, annoying neighbor is suddenly your friend or is is you know the fact that when you're faced with a challenge that is bigger than your kind of daily concerns or your annoyances um things things change and we we've seen that so directly with my own like you know in our own flat and i have four neighbors around me and we used to say hi and but you know everybody's just getting on with their lives and then there was, uh, we were all trying to order food because there was, no, you know, no, no going to supermarkets. Okay, so you order. And there was no slots available for the so local supermarkets. You know, everyone's just like sitting on the screens, like who gets a slot? And then immediately we formed a, a, a group, a mutual aid group. And everyone was just like, I've got a slot. And then everybody's sending their shopping list to this one person who was buying food for all the four uh, apartments. Um, now, this is, is people we've not even like you know we've said how, briefly like hi to so i think that already we are starting to see that um this kind of uh solidarity as as as, as the voiceover says in the film has happened 
in the pandemic and we need to hold on to that it's precious and it's 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 ours and we 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 are we are we are the stewards of our own solidarity if, it, if i can say so um and with the singapore one uh, the one big difference is that we were really by then so kind of embedded in in the idea that what we were creating was not this perfect end result as a design product, which is a, an object or something. But when the thing, the artifact is a living organism and it's so capricious in nature, how do you work with it? And we're very inspired as we have been in the past with the principles of permaculture and uh, companion uh, health of species and uh, working with waste. And so that uh, apartment is a multi-species microcosm of sorts where you're not you're not having things growing on the periphery but you are living in and through and within all the different plants and species who are growing your food for you you are looking after them there's a real kind of reciprocity in that relationship and that reciprocity that ecological reciprocity is reflected even outside where despite having being flooded the ingenuity with ingenuity with which people start to adapt their cityscape and their landscapes reflect uh, this idea that I'm not just going to keep taking from nature, but what do I give back and how do I give back and how do we develop this this new cohabitation, so to speak? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I meant when I said I see a transition because on this comment in the first London room, he's talking about his neighbors, how the situation has created like a network with people mm -hmm. that he didn't relate to before because of their poor taste in music, which is exactly what Facebook <laughs> gives you, you know, like, you know, don't <laughs> talk to your neighbors, like they're listening to, I don't know, to Bruce Springsteen, uh, go talk to people in all over the world that are listening to the exact same record from 1986 mm. that you love so much. I mean, why mm. bother with the name? You know? And, mm -hmm. um, and yet the next one, like expands this solidarity to the outside to non-human uh entities no it, it opens mm -hmm. the door not only to the neighbor to the human neighbors but also to the non-human neighbors including those that are the primordial uh you know wrath of god which is the flood <laughs> like the flood being our most mm -hmm. ancient uh fight against the elements like the elements stop being the element and become one of us um mm -hmm. and this is this is the reason why i mean i thought of um of this uh, kim stanley robinson novel where instead of mm -hmm. floating singapore he floats new york city and um yeah and you know the big section of the city is underwater and it becomes real fun but uh but when i saw it the the thing that brought to mind was was different it was more like belgrade um mm. like this i'm i don't know maybe this is super controversial i'm, I'm sorry in advance but <laughs> but when i saw belgrade a few years ago i was so like stricken by its beauty and its beauty mm -hmm. came so much from a city that has been devastated and then mm. has been taken over by by luscious grain and and i thought how the Japanese always fantasize about this, like the post-nuclear culture in Japan has a lot to do with like robots ruling the world, but the world being like a forest. <laughs> and um, and your piece made me think of all these things at the same time. Um, and then I was checking the installation that you're preparing now for uh, for the Biennale. And, and I had the feeling that you have come full circle <laughs> because uh, you propose a table, a dinner table or lunch table where the humans are pretty much gone, <laughs> no? Where everybody, everything, every creature has a place at the table and has a say. <laughs> and uh, I mean, I haven't seen it because you haven't opened it yet. I think you're opening it in what, like two weeks. But uh, but could you tell something about this? Um, sure. <laughs> um, 
uh, yeah so i mean you know it's 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 a journey i think we are on a journey it's a it's a uh you know how do you say how do i say it's um it's it's a it's a hard one it's a hard one because um you know we are we are at a point in history where um there is so much uh, happening i mean in 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 a sense there's there's real there's a real sense of urgency in in the things and the targets we need to achieve for net zero space say here in the uk by 2050 um I kind of think that um, one, there are different ways you can address these challenges and these crises. And in our work, in terms of full circle, we 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 feel that uh, we need to really reassess our relationship with what we call nature. And again, that's not something that's something we are saying from our experience, but also from being inspired, like I said, from so many countless uh, foresters and gardeners and ecologists work um, to say that you know um, to, to, to if we are able to conceptually really rethink our place in the, on the planet as a human as one species among many um, that is uh, that will require us to uh, really re, re, really shift and change how we live how we live how we relate to each other the relationships we have if we start to think of other species as our companions as our comrades as those we uh, share the planet with then we cannot think of nature as a resource we cannot think of uh, it as something we take from as much as we want to whatever extent we want um, and that is a conceptual conceptual shift and works and stories and narratives and films and um, ideas in the cultural domain that help sh spread these ideas around um, ecological codependence or interdependence um, are, are, I, th I believe are critical in, in this in this time as we as we shift towards addressing some of the biggest crises we face. Indeed, um, or even we could say that we need to start to stop saying nature, you know, as if it was something other <laughs> than absolutely, us. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, it's really interesting because... Management. Yeah, sorry to interrupt, sorry. No, I was, your, your thing about like talking, let's talk, not talk about nature is really interesting because I was reading I was listening to a podcast, I can't remember, the other day when they mentioned that, um, you know, in many indigenous communities, there is no word for wild mm -hmm. uh, because or wilderness because uh, the community is, uh, is part of the wilderness with everything else. So there is no separate word for, for wild uh, because it's not a separate thing outside of the unwild or the non-wild. <laughs> So and that was, again, you know, really beautiful and inspiring uh, to think about, especially because we were, you know, toying, we, we were so kind of, there's so much about the word around rewilding and the politics of rewilding that is going around right at the moment, which is a separate conversation, but really interesting. And I think about it a lot. And I'm, yeah, we, we're really at this point, really experimenting not just at a conceptual level but with materiality with 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 story forms with genres with with uh experiences to try and uh craft uh uh these kind of uh ideas about uh, ecological interdependence yeah also i mean because this story that we're telling ourselves that we are other than nature and that now we're done with this one, we can just go somewhere else, no, like Mars and mm. somehow mm. start, start fresh mm. again, a very narcissistic, um, project, no, like, you know, to always, uh, start things <laughs> and then, and then leave them behind when they get broken, uh, or they are broken mm. by us. But, um, but also there is this idea that, that this Ling Margulis idea that, 
that if we are as we seem to be the the microbe that that over overgrows the the you know <laughs> the the plastic like the container we won't last long and in terms mm -hmm. of the planet and the species that 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 inhabit it we haven't last that long i mean our history is very short compared to mm -hmm. I know to to most stuff in 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 the planet and so if we don't learn to not overcrowd our our place uh we will disappear much faster than than most of the other species because there is so much talking about the sixth extinction which is obviously mm -hmm. happening but Mm -hmm. But we keep talking about it as if it's again something other <laughs> than mm -hmm. us, that we are not distinguishing it, and that we are not being distinguished with it, that we are mm -hmm. somehow separated from it. So I wonder, on on this um, from this perspective, how optimistic do you feel? Because I somehow I, I feel very optimistic, uh, but I find it hard to explain why when I when I sit down and, and consider all the premises. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, um, you know, uh, it's a hard one. Um, so, you know, uh, Kim Stanley Robinson says he's an angry optimist. Uh, I, I, I like that yeah. a lot. Uh, idea that I, I think there is a lot of anger amongst all of us aged aging people with our anger and cynicism um, and if we are able to channel that anger towards navigating precarious paths by plotting these beacons of hope then i i feel optimistic about that and so that that kind of channeling of anger towards something um uh, optimistic um on the other hand i've been doing a project uh, called hope in the heat with six young uh, people where they are imagining their uh, hopes for the, for a climate altered future, and, and and the words that came to mind when when we were talking about their ideas and their kind of spirit and their kind of deep sense of history and their place in on the planet was so moving. It, to me, they were uh, they represented fearless optimism. Even this idea of complete kind of we need to make this happen. We. Uh, and, and so I, I think depending on the position you are in, you know, if you are depending on where you are located and, and, and the world you live in and the, and, the, and the conditions you find yourself in, it will be very different. But um, I, I have to be optimistic, I think. I, I, I am, I am uh, sometimes, I, I, sometimes, you know, when you kind of are able to, having worked in this um, space for a long enough, able to see the second and the third degree consequences of decisions being taken and uh, are able to sort of understand what the unintended uh, uh, implications of something is. It can be uh, quite anxiety inducing, I have to say. But I think it's at that time is how do we hold on to these multiple possibilities? How do we hold on to this optimism and not retreat from this kind of uh, anxiety inducing heartache? That mm -hmm. I find is 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 perhaps uh, perhaps the most challenging part of doing the work we do, but also perhaps the most invigorating in many ways. Hmm. Well, you're not the first that talks about how there is a new generation that has a different approach that is less angry. And I wonder if this has to do with the fact that most of us, um, like our anger is, is somehow coming from a lot of guilt too, because we are the generation that transitioned from everything is fine to everything is fucked. <laughs> so I guess we carry a lot of guilt uh, from our own mm. contribution to it, which is something that new generation, the youngest generation, doesn't have, and so that energy can be can be placed somewhere else. I wonder, mm. but I mean, you described the work you do as a slow form of critical 
activism. And so I would like to uh, finish this uh, conversation and I want to remind our listeners again, please send your questions because um, um, you know we're running out of time and I forgot to say it before. Please send your questions, uh, put them in the box that Axioma has left for you and uh, uh, Nature will read them later. But um, going back to me, <laughs> how can we, how would you say we can train our future sense or our predictive minds or our storytelling uh, machine to become the kind of activist uh, that you are, this kind of, uh, to, to engage in this slow form of critical activism? Uh, um, <laughs> oh gosh um i mean you know i think a lot of things that we were talking about you know paying attention to the present being self-aware considering the future um quite a lot of times you know it helps um to consider someone we deeply care about someone young we deeply care about um and imagining their life in the future and um, you know um, um so, some thing happened the other day when um we said uh 88 years in the future for something something was good and my son wanted to know how who you know no 20 2099 you know the year before it's it's 2100 and you know mm -hmm. it's like Twenty one ninety nine, before it's twenty two zero zero. Yeah, <laughs> getting mixed up with centuries. <laughs> um, oh, and uh, then I was telling my son, you know, that okay, on twenty one ninety nine, uh, you will be whatever eighty two years old or eighty nine years or something like that, eighty eight years old or something. Um, and that just even just saying that for a moment just freaked me out because even though we think a lot about these things just imagining an eight-year-old to be an 88 year old in front of me sat there does does things at an emotional level like nothing else and you know i think holding on to that idea of someone we deeply care about or something or somebody or, or a non who a tree you've planted you know it immediately i think the questions that come to mind are what can i do to affect or empower their future or you know uh, if if i were haunting their future how would i want my actions to have affected their lives and you know just having those kind of questions and provocations um can really be very very um i suppose helpful and meaningful I mean, you know, don't just keep thinking about that all the time because that also freak you out. But um, having that at the back of our mind is, is useful. <laughs> it is. I think we can't make a political campaign with that concept, though, <laughs> because, like, you know, imagine, uh, you know, your son 30 years, 40 years later, which is something that we can do because everybody has done the how will you be in this, you know, time yeah. uh, AI yeah. test because it would it would it would be like the like the labels that you find in the tobacco boxes no that tell you like you know your son will be grieving in your grave because you smoked or mm. <laughs> or you know, stop. your son will be secondhand smoking you smoke like you know the, the reaction that you get is is, is, is one of rejection because, you know, yeah. it, it hurts, uh, not in this, not even in the sense of guilt, but it hurts to think about it. And this is one mm -hmm. of the reasons why I so much love your work, because you manage to convey that with something that, that is, that is not despair, <laughs> that is not mm -hmm. dark, that is not even like the room I mean, I was very taken by the Singapore uh, installation, the mitigation of shock, but uh, because there was so much greeniness, so much openness, mm. so much life in the frame. But the, the, the room in London, which is full of like, you know, neon lights and machinery, which is something that I'm not particularly fond of, 
um, at the moment, especially after a year of lockdown, uh, it just felt so much fun. Like it felt mm. like living in a lab of your own where you are constantly learning things that are in your immediate environment that are full of wonder, like, you know, like discovering the microscope and the telescope at the same time and having them both to work with. So I must say, um, you are so definitely in the right path. I don't think anyone can resist that, that feeling that the future is scary, but it'll, it can also be so much fun. <laughs> it will be different and it will be hard and it will also be something different than this state of, of, of uh, inertia, <laughs> of consuming mm. inertia, this um, Alice <laughs> falling through the hole that we are all somehow trapped in. So before I give uh, my word to our, to our three special guests, I want to thank you. Uh, Anna, you. for your amazing, amazing work, uh, your incredible research, and I hope I can see your installation in Venice very soon. Thank you, Martha. That was great questions. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, Janice, let's go. Let's go to our special three guests of tonight. I think our first one is not even in Ljubljana, is uh, greeting us from somewhere else. Hi, yeah, hi. Uh, hi. I'm Spiele, hi. Um, yes, I'm, I'm phoning in from Amsterdam. Uh, thank you very much, Anup, uh, for uh, this lovely conversation. And it got me thinking about my art practice, which in many ways deals with these really difficult questions where, of course, if you could somehow make it all better and, you know, solve the problems or make the problems go away, you would. But unfortunately, uh, you get trapped in these uneasy, um, uh, with, with stuck with uneasy notions uh, and impossible choices. Um, and what I would like to ask you is to share with us, if possible, uh, some stories of uh, the process of making these artworks that you undertook. Because with uh, speculative uh, or science fiction, the worlds that you create require a lot of research, a lot of checking mm -hmm. whether the assumptions have some validity or not. And I would be wondering if you could share with us uh, an example of um, a situation where you were actually surprised by the research, where you went in with a different idea that you actually came out. And mm -hmm. uh, especially, um, I was wondering if um, some of these um, made you feel, you know, vulnerable and complicit. And I think this was mentioned before, but mm -hmm. others uh, also on the other side of the spectrum where you actually felt empowered. And I sort of remember you also explaining some of this, but if you could have like a concrete story for us, that would mm -hmm. be really fantastic. Thank you. Wow. Thanks, Bella. That's a really, really good question. <laughs> Big one. Um, uh i you are really it's really it, it is true that you know at no point are we suggesting that this is the future or this is you know so it's one possibility and and that process of what stays out and what stays in when we have this real breadth of um data and research and insights and interviews is is that we are also storytellers and we we are trying to tell a story and 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 um, create this emotional resonance because uh, it is not trying to it's not about trying to tell people that this is a, a future or an apartment in the future in london that you'll find yourselves living in as much as uh, what would it mean to live in a space that looks so significantly different in so many ways i mean an interesting example was we were talking to um, uh, climate scientists uh, at the Earth Observatory in Singapore, Dr. Ben Horton, um, about a sea level rise in Southeast Asia, especially Singapore, because, you know, there is a lot of work being done in that space. 
and you know we we had this idea of uh, having uh, people in these HPT apartments having their own canoes um, to slide down and go around uh, foraging and uh, he was just like of course not we will have solar jet skis everywhere and uh, <laughs> it was a scientist who was telling us that we should populate the city's uh, rivers, flooding rivers with solar jet skis, which is fascinating. And we did contemplate it. In the end, we did go for a canoe. Um, I'm just very fond of canoes <laughs> personally as well. But uh, that was, uh, you know, so there are so many such instances where, especially with El Nino and uh, kind of these big climate uh, forecasting systems you start to talk to more and more climate scientists and you realize how much of it is fiction and how much of it they acknowledge being fiction because these these models are constantly changing so depending on the climate system that you decide to kind of attach your scenario to it could be completely different from what the other climate system is talking about so they, these were some quite important critical decisions we needed to make and um, it wasn't easy but we decided to go with the ones that uh, uh, also helped the narrative arc because it became amply clear when you're talking about that far in the future a lot of it is fiction thank you very much thank you Well, I think our other two guests are in the studio with uh, Janice and Marcella and Nature. So here we have the second second question from our special guest. Hi. Hello, Hello. my name is Sasha. Um, thank you for your illuminating talk. I really appreciated both questions and answers. And um, I'm really uh, admired your artist, artistic research and I was um, sort of wondering while well, I was I was also very impressed with this transition from uh, lab um, London's apartment to Singapore because basically because I went into a little detail uh, into there you had this uh, food production which was monocultural and then it transitioned into permaculture and I really loved that detail so I was wondering do you see that as two um, how, how would they say would this be polyphonic futures that we're looking at to different ones or would be this a, a one moment in time that you saw this kind of future in London and then another moment in time that you imagine some other uh, future in Singapore? So this would be one question. And because um, I also see this transition also as a transition from in the uh, sort of individual plant to a, a network of plants and other species, multi species network. So would you say that here is also sort of a teaching of fungi who also make networks mm -hmm. that um, what we can learn from them is basically the network kind of uh, being? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Sasha. Um, great question. I'll take the first one because it's kind of connected to the second one in a sense that um, I, I think both the apartments had multiple species growing, but the first one was very heavily dependent on this technique of fog ponics, which was that uh, it was just nutrient fog, no water or soil that was helping the uh, different uh, growing systems grow really quickly. But what became clear in our learning journey for that was that you're really heavily dependent on a technology of these foggers and the ultrasonic foggers and the kind of Arduino systems and the sensors and all of them doing their job really well. And if anything breaks in the system, then you are left with a broken food computer and which is a networked food computer. And so that has a direct implication on, on the food you receive from, from these systems. So um, John really led this uh, research in the studio and um, made this conscious decision to, to move away from these uh, dependency on technological systems to drive a food at home and we spent a lot of time he came back to something he did before which is a lot of research in permaculture and we were inspired by the principles of permaculture but of course to bear in mind that permaculture is an outdoor uh, practice while we were talking about systems that grow indoors but 
really we use this full spectrum light as opposed to just this two colored light which is really imitating sunlight we we like i said worked with soil health companion species uh circular waste you know all these things um in the singapore and that yes is in a way a networked um approach yeah thank you very much thank thanks Okay. Hi, uh, Hello. I'm Anya. Hi. Uh, actually, Hi, I'm Annie. an architect. Uh, I was really interested in your perception and your picking of the apartment as the place of your action. Uh, mm. Because apartment is we, yeah, historically and even up today we know it and we understand it is a pl place of privacy. So we go home for privacy to get away from the public. But when I think of um, moving even into a garden, creating an indoor garden in the apartment and uh, making food, making it a sort of micro food production unit, uh, actually this apartment starts to internalize the spaces that we are used to go to outdoors. Um, and at the same time, I was thinking of uh, the Second World War. Maybe you know the... Um, the victory gardens they were uh, in britain also in ljubljana we had this sort of gardens that were actually um yeah the parks public parks were used for gardening mm -hmm. to product for production of food and actually what uh, the purpose of these gardens was not only uh, food production it was also to build solidarity it was really mm -hmm. to sort of build up spirit of um, let's say really um, spirit uh, within the hard times. And mm -hmm. this is what made me think, why you mm -hmm. chose, why did you choose uh, the apartment as an indoor mm -hmm. um, space for creation of new solidarity? Or can mm -hmm. the apartment as a private space can become a place of solidarity and for the solidarity? Wow. Thank you, Anya. Um, yes, uh, really good question. Uh, we, uh, our intention of uh, using the apartment or a domestic space or domestic private space, as you said, was precisely because we wanted to bring, make this very amorphous idea of climate change into something that is truly relatable and is, is, is emotionally uh, experienceable at, at a very direct level and uh, we chose to think about it from the lens of food because uh, it's something we can all relate to but also our domestic space that we live in so it, we really wanted to make it a personal experience which is why it was definitely uh, the domestic space as a home and a home that might have to live in a climate altered it is it is belonging to a certain group of individuals who have decided to live together or an, a single individual. Um, the other thing to say was that we were a lot of our the data that we were looking at around the climate uh, change uh, scenarios was deep uncertainty around external weather conditions, very fragile uh, supply chains. And so the, the 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 idea that you might have crop growing outside but you just don't know what you'll get and therefore we were keen to explore the possibility of something that you could grow indoors and that's where the whole kind of journey started for us and it's really interesting you mentioned the idea of solidarity because at a fundamental level we imagine every home to be very different and to be growing to be able to grow very different things at very different scales, but that there being a growers network, so there was actually a growers network data and details in the apartment as well, where people were sharing uh, 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 produce and sharing, you know, what what they have access of in exchange for, like an allotment sort of thing. So very interesting overlaps between a public and a semi-public to private space, a public space. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I mean, it's kind of interesting also that your third, um, well, it's not a mitigation of shock, but your new installation for Venice is called Refuge for Resurgence. 
and the Biennale theme this year is how will we live together? And it's not an apartment, but a forest, no? It's placed in a forest. So it's like you've been somehow opening doors and windows uh, until you ended up in the forest, I guess. Well, um, uh, so now we have uh, our beautiful nature. Hi, nature, how are you doing? Hi, Marta, I'm doing great. Uh, thank you both for this compelling discussion. I loved it. And Anap, I'm deeply fascinated with your work. We have selected three questions from the audience today. Uh, the first one coming from Nika Mahnitz. They ask, um, in what way can rewilding be understood as a retreat from designing or programming processes? What should not be subject to design? Um, that's a really good question. I have to say I'm not an expert in rewilding and I would not be uh, saying anything that would make um, that, like, you know, scientific sense in this sense, uh, in a sense. Rewilding is a complex process done by uh, practitioners who've been doing it for a long time. Um, what I can answer to is the fact that no, everything doesn't need to be designed. Um, maybe that's where the problem lies. And I'm up for all the undesigning we can do. <laughs> so I'll leave it at that. that that's a good, that's a good answer. Um, Thanks. <laughs> well, uh, Mata asked the following question. How can we motivate people to take action, but not scare them or leave them feeling completely hopeless in the face of the challenge? Yeah, I get asked that all the time. I think we ask each other that all the time, don't we? Like how, how, and it's not easy, it's especially not easy because, you know, whilst uh, with COVID, we can see some very obvious loss and grief and anxiety. There's so much hidden that we can't see. So, you know, I think this idea that come what may, let's cope with whatever comes our way and let's not, let's brush all our, uh, anxieties and, and grief under the carpet. Uh, I, I don't think it is easy. I don't think it is easy to say that, um, uh, take it on the chin kind of a response. But at the same time, um, I think uh, if we are able to understand the scale of challenge, which is often hard in itself, uh, we, we, uh, we have to, I suppose, um think about what we deeply care about and find the motivation that we can to 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 to, to rise to that uh, challenge it's it's um with a caveat that, that none of this is uh, even remotely easy and for our third and last question yana asks for an angry optimist, is it important to imagine both utopian and dystopian futures and why? <laughs> Thanks, Yana. I mean, you know, uh, I try and I don't think there's any such thing as complete utopia or dystopia. So um, I think that gray space in between is the space for the angry optimist to say in I, don't. I think we may swing towards dystopia or we may swing towards utopia, but uh, uh, th there is no 100% utopia. And we've seen the experiments, history has told us the experiments in uh, trying to achieve utopia have failed uh, catastrophically. So I would say um, that if you steer clear of the two extremes um, and, and, and explore that space in between, then uh, you probably are an angry optimist. Thank you. Thank, thank you thank for you. all the answers to our questions. And uh, I give the mic back to you, Marta. Well, thank you, Nature. Um, lovely to see you as always. And uh, I think we have come to a close. So again, thank you all for watching. Uh, Thank you for being interested in science and the future and all the possibilities uh, that uh, Anab Jain and Superflux uh, bring us. 
and and very and most especially thank you again Annette, for making some time to talk to us uh i am so looking forward to seeing your installation and um and you know and and get to um get to understand this uh possible forest uh this multi-species encounter that you are that you are building right now so Again, it was a pleasure and an honor, and I hope to see you very soon in the flesh. Great. Thank you, Martha. Thanks for hosting me and for a great discussion. Thanks, Axioma, for inviting me, and thanks everyone who tuned in. Have a lovely rest of your day, evening. <laughs> thanks, Martha. Thanks, Anab, for the insightful discussion, and thanks also to our special guests in the studio and to all of you who decided to follow us and contribute to the debate through the web chat. Reprogramming returns on June 21st at 12 noon Central European time with a fifth episode dedicated this time to AI featuring distinguished NYU professor Kate Crawford in conversation with Marta Perano. Kate's seminal research examines the social implications of data systems, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. She is the author of Atlas of AI, Power, Politics, and the Planetary Cost of Artificial Intelligence, a book about the hidden cost of AI, from natural resources and labor to privacy, equality, and freedom. To stay up to date on our programs, events, and publications, follow us on social media or subscribe to our YouTube and Vimeo channels. That's all for today. Greetings from Ljubljana. Nasvidenje. Thank you.